We've been dealing with the doctrine of God, a study of theology proper. And if you will, I want us to turn back to chapter 2, but I want us to look at section 2. And we're just going to read through it and make some comment on it because it really is supportive of all that we have taught thus in the first section. But just to remind us of what has and what is our official understanding of the teaching concerning the very essence and the nature of God. If there's one thing I have seen for years, one of the great lacks in the church is the understanding of who God is. They do not understand Him. They do not understand the nature of His being. They have no fear of God before their eyes because they do not know Him. They do not fear Him. And the reason they do not fear Him is they do not know Him. But the day when they know Him, they do, and they will fear Him. And that's what we need to teach our people. The church has lost its understanding of God. Today, the church thinks they can manipulate God. But He is not going to be manipulated. He is so, so, so different from us. But we keep wanting to make Him in our image. Well, chapter 2, <clears throat> the doctrine of God and the Holy Trinity. In section 2, the Westminster Divines wrote, God has all life, glory, goodness, blessedness, in and of himself, and is alone in and unto himself all sufficient, not standing in need of any creature which he has made, nor deriving any glory from them, but only manifesting his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. He is the alone fountain of all being, of whom, through whom, and to whom are all things, and has most sovereign dominion over them, to do by them, for them, or upon them, whatsoever he pleases. In his sight all things are open, and manifest. His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent of the creature. So as the nothing to him is contingent, nor uncertain. He is most holy in all his counsels, in all his works, and in all his commands. To him is due from angels and men and every other creature whatsoever worship, service, and obedience he is pleased to require of them. Now, again, <clears throat> we direct you back to the fact that the Westminster Divines have held that there is but one only true and living God. There are no gods contending with God. There is no such thing as any other God. There are gods by the standards of other religions, but we know that those gods simply do not exist. And therefore, there is no absolute, no way that God is trying to outdo other gods or is in contention with other gods or is trying to overcome other gods or that there is a struggle among the gods. There is simply one God. And that one God reigns sovereignly. The substance of his nature, the doctrine that we maintain, comes from but one source for our theology, and that is the Holy Scripture. The Holy Scripture is that source which we look unto. This God possesses all his attributes in divine perfection. He is lacking in nothing. Thus, he is a self-existent and he is independent and he does all things that pleaseth him. Now, if you will, look at what the Westminster wrote here in chapter 2. God has all life, goodness, Blessedness in and of himself. First, the divines are proclaiming that God is the creator and sustainer of life. Life simply comes from God. 
If God ceased to think life, we would die. The whole creation would die. It would cease to exist. That is how dependent all creation is upon God. But all life comes from God. It does not come from any other source. Now, they're also pointing out that God does all things for His glory. Very important. Why do the things that come to pass, why do they come to pass if God is sovereign? Because God simply has ordered that those are the things that should come to pass. We accept it. That's what our doctrine of divine providence is all about. We do not understand why some things take place. But I guarantee you it is according to the decree of God and in His providence He had a purpose and a meaning. And we better be careful about questioning his wisdom. And so we must look to understand what is God teaching us? Why is he teaching us the things that we are to learn? How in his divine providence Hath he made clear those things that he desired to bring past? I guarantee you it's all for one thing, his glory and honor. And it will be the advancement of his kingdom. And it may not come to pass the way that you and I would like for it to come to pass. But then our idea of reality is Disney World. But that's not the reality of the world God has created. Nor is it the world in which man has fallen into sin. But nevertheless, God has created everything to honor Him, to glorify Him. He is the true definition of goodness. And goodness is as He defines it to us. God is our blessedness. And blessedness only comes, or blessings, if you will, from our God. They go on to say, and is alone in and of to himself self-sufficient, not standing in need of any creature which he has made. Let's be very clear about this. God is the sole divine being that exists. He is totally all-sufficient in himself. He does not need nor depend upon anything else but himself to exist. God did not need man. He did not need the created order of the universe. He was as sufficient in himself. He had no lack of anything. He was not lonely. Perfect Unity and harmony and fulfillment existed in the divine trinity. Thus, we are not in a position to think that God needs us. That without us, (coughs) He cannot fulfill himself. (coughs) Excuse me. That simply is just not the case. He needs nothing. He stands in need of nothing from his creatures. We have a very poor idea of God if we think that God needs us or needs something from us. Oh, he demands things that we are to do, but it does not deter from his decree going forward. They continue, nor deriving any glory from them, the creatures, but only manifesting his glory in, by, unto, and upon them. The purpose of the creature is that God can manifest his glory in them, by them, unto them, and upon them. They do not glorify him of their own ability or of anything they could contribute to him. 
Thus they continue, he is the alone fountain of all being. Of whom, through whom, and unto whom are all things. And has most sovereign dominion over them. To do by them, for them, and upon them whatsoever he pleases. God is the only source of existence. All that exists comes from him. There is nothing that exists apart from God being creator. If it does, it is co-equal with God. And it cannot be. He hath spoken things into existence. Literally, he's thought them into existence. His sovereign dominion is over them. So he is able, therefore, as creator, to do as he pleases without question. If you remember what St. Paul said in Romans, he said, so what if the potter has a desire to take one lump of clay and to make two vessels from it, one to be kept and one to be destroyed? Can the vessel to be destroyed say, why have you made me thus if he is the creator of it? Of course not. I created you for a purpose. You serve my purpose. Whether you like it or you don't, I didn't consult with you. And you have no say in my authority. It's hard for us to understand that because we have so been taught bad theology for so many years. We really want gods that are like the Greeks. They have passions. They have emotions. And if we're just as a passionate and emotional, and if we bring the right sacrifices to his feet, we believe God ought to want to do something for us. That's what the Greeks were always contending for. Their whole purpose of sacrificing and everything else they did for their gods was to somehow get them to think that they were good enough they would grant them a blessing. Our God cannot be manipulated. Now, we who are Reformed understand that. The world, of course, does not. Neither does probably 80% of the church that claims to be evangelical. And I probably will not be here in the future when things begin to change. But mark my word, if you're still here, on this day I told you what God wanted will come to pass. And no one can stay his hand. He will knock nations down one after another for his own glory. Scripture says he raises them up. He tears down the kings that he raises up, and he will rent the nation and to literally destroy the nation that will not serve him. Do not forget what the Scripture says. The nation that turns its back upon God shall be cast into hell. We don't fear our God. That's the greatest problem in America. And the greater problem is the fact it's the church that doesn't believe it. I don't know why we would believe that the world without Christ would believe it. Well, they finally said in his sight, all things are open and manifest. His knowledge is infinite and fallible, independent upon the creature. So as nothing is to be contingent or uncertain, nothing can be hidden from God. God is not looking into the future to try to understand what the future is so that he can make arbitrary decisions. The future is what God hath decreed from the beginning. The end from the beginning and the beginning from the end, the Scripture says. All things have been predetermined by the decree of God to come to pass exactly in his purpose and for his glory. And because he has an omniscient will, all things are manifest in his knowledge of how he hath put them forth. It is an infinite God. He is an infallible God. He is so independent of his creature, but the creature is yet to learn it. Then they say he is the most holy in all his counsels. He is most holy in his works, 
in His commands. God is holy. That is to say, there is no other God like unto Him. Of course not. He is unique, and His counsels demonstrate that. The works of His hands, as it were, in anthropomorphic language, manifest that. And all that He commands manifest the fact that there is no God like unto Him. They continue to Him as due from angels and men, every other creature, whatsoever worship, service, or obedience, He is pleased to require of them. Notice, if you will, what is owed to God by angels, men, and all other creatures is worship, service to, and obedience as it is required by God of them as it is written in His Word. That's what God expects from us. When we are doing the will of God, when we are seeking His will, when we are seeking to praise His name, to do those things that He has commanded of us in worship, in obedience, and in service to His kingdom, then God will bless us. He will bless our churches. He will bless our children, and He will multiply them, and He will bless our nation. We need to get a glimpse of the God of Holy Scripture as He has revealed himself in all of his attributes. He does not compare, the triune God does not compare him to anything you can envision. He just declares his attributes as the part of his nature. And he expects you, by faith, in obedience, to honor, to worship, and to please him. That's our state of humility as believers. That's our duty to be carried out every day of our life. May God help us to do that very thing.